Hi everyone, welcome back to more English with Dry. Today we are going to take a look at Macbeth and his soliloquy Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow in Act 5, Scene 5. This video is based on an essay written in a scholarly article by Horst Brewer on the disintegration of time in his soliloquy. It is going to focus in detail on this essay, the citation for which you can see below, and look at some of the ideas explored in it pertaining to Macbeth and how he experiences time both in the soliloquy and in the play as a whole. I'll post the link in the description to this article so that you can check it out there too. Firstly, we'll remind ourselves of what Macbeth says in Act 5, Scene 5. He has just been informed that his wife is dead, and he is starting to consider the possibilities of what will happen next. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Now, despite being one of the most famous speeches in all of Shakespeare, this one asks some specifically interesting questions about the nature of time and also man's mortality. The question I would like you to think about is what his main message in this soliloquy is. Who is he talking to and how does he feel? I suggest that you highlight some key terms as we go through this speech yourself. Initially, we will talk about something called Teatrum Mundi, a Latin expression that means the world is a theatre. The second half of the speech is fairly simple to understand because it discusses Macbeth's despair over being alive. By this point in the play, everything he had planned has failed to come true. Everything that he was promised seems to have deceived him in some way, and he's beginning to realise the pointlessness of everything. This is called nihilism, and the lines contain a very nihilistic impression of existence. They metaphorically compare the world to a theatre, and being alive to an actor playing a part. This trope, which is known as Teatrum Mundi, positions man as playing a plaything of the gods, who, like playwrights, compose a script for us to follow for the purposes of the amusement of those watching. The reference to the tale being told by an idiot speaks to the futility of life and Macbeth's belief by this point that he has no control over his own destiny. In short, Macbeth despairs because he feels life has no meaning as God controls what we do like a playwright and an actor in a play. He believes that his agency is completely gone. I'll take this point to pause and ask you some questions. How do you understand time? If someone asked you to, how would you define it? Do you think that it is something designated by God? How would you feel if time stopped working in the normal way? For instance, what would you do if the sun didn't come up tomorrow? Take a few minutes to ponder these things. Time imagery and disintegration of time. The first half of this speech is replete with time imagery. Macbeth references the inevitable passing of time and the futility he comes to associate with it. Shakespeare in this speech alludes to tomorrow as being governed or controlled by yesterday, and human experience as being designed to make a mockery of us all. He equally references the drudgery of existence, suggesting that death will be a release from the pain of our time on this mortal coil, which is an expression used in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet is a play that we will come on to a little bit more further on in the video that bears a lot of similarities with this passage. However, to understand fully what Shakespeare means, it's necessary to understand the contemporary viewpoint on the concept of time. In short, Macbeth now sees as he has no power, everything is meaningless, and that it will be a relief to finally die. Samuel Beckett is the contemporary writer who is obsessed with the theme of how time works. Writing in the early 20th century, in his plays there was little sense of a beginning, middle and end. Instead, his plots were repetitive and circular. His characters do not change or develop, they progress slowly but inevitably towards the end. Time can be absent entirely or present as an endless and aimless duration. However, in all his plays, time is the essential principle of order, and it is missing. Time means organisation, purpose, coherence and wholeness. In short, Beckett believed time is essential and controls what we do as it helps life make sense. 
One of Beckett's most famous plays, Waiting for Godot, is a perfect example of this, in that the two characters endlessly wait, seemingly for the arrival of a someone who will never come. It is this sense of time being futile and, when lost, disintegrating order that is particularly relevant to Macbeth's speech. Time and God. Can you sum up the relationship between the concept of time and the concept of an omnipotent God? Is there any connection between the two? Is one dependent on the other? Pause for a few minutes and try to work out your answer to some of these questions. Time is a factor of order. For medieval and Renaissance thinking, the idea of time was connected with the movements of the stars and their spheres, and more especially of the sun with its invariable course. The age of Shakespeare still valued stability and time. In the medieval period was a symbol of this. Time was a symbol for the spiritual order of Catholicism as well as for the stability of medieval communal life. The societal patterns of this tradition-directed way of life persisted to a certain extent in the Tudor and Stuart epoch. Living outside of time, that is to say, living in such a way as to ignore the passage of time in the Middle Ages as well as in the Renaissance, was equal to living outside the society of men and outside the grace of God. In short, in the time of Shakespeare, time was linked with God. Life revolved around God, and therefore all life was governed by the passing of time like days and seasons and years. If you imagine being an individual in those times, you have to imagine that the only thing that mattered was time, and that time was defined by the passage of days. This was what gave people order and gave people a sense of purpose. They were entirely lost with what to do. Divine Order the correspondence between God, King, Son, Time, Reason, Music has been shown to be ubiquitous in Shakespeare's works. Macbeth is the locus classicus for images of cosmic order. That means that it is the most classic play when we consider images of cosmic order and disorder. For here the superhuman plane is expressly introduced into the drama in the witch's scenes. The murder of Duncan is described as most sacrilegious murder, as the very disruption of the universe. Confusion now hath made his masterpiece, Macduff cries horror-stricken after having found Duncan in his blood, thus ascribing the deed to the Antichrist, personified as chaos and confusion. In short, when Macbeth murders Duncan, he goes against the great chain of being. This creates confusion and chaos. Because he disrupts this order, he can also be seen as disrupting the order of time. The New Age. What does the term New Age suggest to you? Do you think we currently live in a New Age? What do you think a New Age would constitute for an Elizabethan audience? How might it be different from the past? Take a moment to consider your answers to these questions. Elizabethan Insecurity. Macbeth is more than simply a murderer, and the play is more than just a study in fear and guilty conscience, or in vaulting ambition overleaping statement of evil. The conflict in Macbeth is represented on a cosmic scale, because fundamentally it is the conflict between two warring conceptions of man and the universe. On the one hand are the gradually declining standards of the feudal age. The feudal age was the name given to the way society was run before the time of Queen Elizabeth and during the beginning of it. It was allegiance to the king, humble acceptance of one's place in society, chivalric honour, social responsibility, faithfulness to custom and tradition, and there are historically progressive attitudes like individualism, aspiration, adventurous enterprise, marital love. Society was fairly conflicted, therefore, in that there was the old-fashioned way of viewing the world and the new age. Specifically, the concept of individualism was important. The idea that individual people as people was more important than all of us being cogs in the same wheel. It is safe to conceive of Macbeth as an anti-feudal character who, however, cannot step out of his traditional order without virtually losing his identity. So, feudalism was the dominant social system in medieval Europe, in which the nobility held lands from the crown in exchange for military service. This is why Duncan can call upon any men in Scotland who live in the land ruled by him to fight for him. And vassals were in turn tenants of the nobles, while the peasants, 
villains or serfs as they were called, were obliged to live on their lord's land to give him homage, labour, and a share of the produce, notionally in exchange for military protection. As the old systems that govern society broke down, however, people became more uncertain and scared of the new world. By committing an act that directly breaks these systems down, Macbeth acts out of this fear and shows us the world many feared they were heading into. One without God, where even the basic order of the world was gone, the passage of time. This is why it seems an almost eternal night by the end of the play. Macbeth, by killing Duncan, has effectively removed himself from this plane of being. He has removed himself from God's path and God's plan for the world. And this is why there appears to be no time, or no day, and no individual night. No place for God. Try to imagine being told there was no God. How might this affect a religious person's view of the world? What would they be left with? How would it change how they lived? Have a moment to think about your answers to these questions. A New Age Existence Without God Due to its flagrant disregard for the idea of a god, Macbeth's murder is a historically progressive act from feudalism and Catholicism, a violent plunge into the doubts new into the doubts new age. Shakespeare, however, shows that from medieval bondage may lead to an even more horrible kind of enslavement, namely to inhumanity and self-alienation. The New Age has forfeited the comforting safety of a life under the tutelage of God's holy church and laws, and spiritual loneliness and insecurity takes the place of the old stability and humility. What a gigantic challenge is this new rapture of freedom and self-sufficiency and individualism, but as in the case of Macbeth, what appalling hazards too. In short, the freedom from God and his order turns Macbeth to madness. Life is unstructured and fearful. Shakespeare could have been showing how a lawless post-feudal age was not a good thing. The Sun Heaven's face does glow over the solidity and compound mass with heated visage, as against the doom is thought sick at the act. Shakespeare's favourite image for the disintegration of traditional stability is the eclipse of the sun, the sun being a symbol of time as well as of the king and hierarchical degree in general. In Hamlet, a play which, like Macbeth, the destruction of the old order is murder and usurpation, cosmic chaos is depicted as the sun glowing feverishly over man's disintegrating world. Shortly after discovering that Duncan has died, Macduff speaks to Macbeth, who says, Had I but died an hour before this chance, I'd have lived a blessed time. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All but is toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees is left the vault to brag of. Macbeth's deed causes time to stop for a moment, comparable to the hour of Christ's death. The sun does not rise. Compare Macbeth's I gin to be a weary of the sun in Act 5, Scene 5, Line 49. The heavens pause, man stands dazed by the terrible consequences of his unforeseen emancipation from his inherited system of values. Is Macbeth free? The strain of this newly adopted self-reliance and solitude has a profound effect on Macbeth's mind. He does not break down, as his wife does, but he too undergoes a radical alteration of personality. Before his fall from grace, he was deeply imaginative and emotional, but afterwards he becomes tense, rigid, numb, automaton-like, chilled with despair, bizarrely cold and unemotional, a fanatic of violence, a killer without a cause, a dying gladiator, a blinded lion at bay. If Lady Macbeth is insane in her way, so is Macbeth in his. The appalling vision of the huge vault of heaven being essentially empty, a mocking echo reverberating hollowly over this bank and shoal of time, has literally unhinged him. Macbeth is stunned by his new consciousness that man is a stranger in his world, that the universe does not provide a natural hope for him, that there is no profound plan in the structure of society and in the life of the individual. Time is no longer a guarantee of order and coherence. The movements of the stars no longer obey the decree of a god, who man is about to discover to be a creation of his own mind. In short, the enormity of an absence of God in his world blows Macbeth's mind and turns him to madness. He could be reaffirming the importance of Christianity and loyalty to the king. 
John Donne on Renaissance individualism. John Donne, a famous English poet, once wrote, And new philosophy calls all in doubt, the element of fire is quite put out. The sun is lost, and the earth, and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. And freely men confess that this world spent, when in the planet and in the firmament. They seek so many new, they see that this is crumbled again to his atomies. Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone, all just supply, and all relation, prince, subject, father, son, are things forgot. For every man alone thinks he hath got to be a phoenix, and that he then can be none of that kind of which he is but he. No certainty left. These well-known lines from John Donne's Anatomy of the World sums up the predicament of Renaissance individualism, where the old moulds of life were shattered, the security and orientation provided were obliterated too. This, and not the message of his wife's death, is the background to Macbeth's soliloquy, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Macbeth has waded in blood a long way since he last saw pity astride the blast, or since he had need of blessing. He has cut off those parts of his being which still adhere to the old system of values, and with them those which were full of the milk of human kindness. Inside himself he feels nothing but infinite emptiness and coldness. Having supped full with horrors, he has almost forgotten the taste of fears. He is past remorse and past regret. Physically as well, Macbeth is solitary deserted, lost in the void of an indifferent universe. In short, Macbeth's lack of any kind of feeling reflects the emptiness of a life away from God. The Nightmare of Time Time has become entropic for Macbeth, this word meaning when order breaks down. It is no longer governed by the medieval idea of order, which appointed an appropriate place to every day and every action. Time is a nightmare succession of incidents without significance, a mere succession of meaningless days elapsing incessantly and never mounting up to a life. The view into the future is hopeless. Macbeth sees nothing but a hideous procession of ant-like tomorrows creeping towards him. In an agonizingly petty pace and looking backwards, he sees them, when their time present is over, crawling worm-like from him in the dust towards death. History, recorded time, is no longer the edifying volume capable of unravelling the muddle of man's life. It is the incoherent stutter of fragmentary syllables which will never again be compounded in a neat pattern of meaningful sentences. In short... Macbeth can no longer trust even the passage of time by the end of this play. Told by an idiot. Macbeth, once he has jumped the life to come, discovers history to be a tale told by an idiot. Time is logos, in its symbolic meaning here emphasised. Its disintegration, therefore, is consequently represented as a sequence of disconnected syllables, as the incoherent gabble of a madman. Macbeth's and the unnameable vision of man's life are fundamentally the same. No memory of anything, no hope of anything, no knowledge, no history, and no prospects. For Macbeth, nothing remains but his maniacal code of valour and violence, which makes him fight his course bear-like to the very end. I hope you found this video to be useful. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them underneath. I look forward to seeing you next time. Good luck revising. <laughs>